The candidate for governor of New Jersey, Diane Sayre, who will speak on the Glass-Steagall fight in the United States. Okay. Good afternoon. And I heard a rumor that we will get to eat after my presentation. <laughs> um, I actually would like to start with the uh, greetings from Congressman Walter Jones, which I think is very important because Walter Jones is a Republican congressman. He is an important figure in two bills in the Congress. One is uh, he was the first Republican co-sponsor of Marcy Kaptur's bill to reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act. He also introduced HCR 3, which is a bill that says the president who goes to war without consent of the Congress has committed an impeachable offense. And what I hope to make clear in my presentation, as Mr. LaRouche has said, is that the fight for Glass-Steagall, and as my fellow panelists have said, is an absolute war. And one aspect of the war is the necessary removal of Obama from office since he is functioning as the tool of the queen to block all of this. So we'll start with the greetings from Congressman Jones. Hello, my name is Walter Jones. I represent the 3rd District of North Carolina, and it's an honor for me to be speaking to those of you in attendance at the Schiller Institute uh, Forum. Uh, this is so important and critical. The title of your meeting is Attaining Freedom Through Necessity, The Last Chance of Humanity. The reason that I've been asked to address you briefly is that I am the Republican in the House of Representatives who have joined the Democrat, Marcy Captain, in the reinstatement of Glass-Steagall. In my humble opinion, this is one of the most important pieces of legislation in the House of Representatives and soon to be in the Senate if we're going to maintain sanity on the financial markets. There is no way that this world will exist if we do not return sanity to the financial markets. I see right here in America that there's so much activity in Washington, D.C. by these big banks who don't want to see a reinstatement of Glass-Steagall. Uh, they try to influence other members and say, no, don't go on that bill with Marcy Kept and Walter Jones. But I want to say to the LaRouche people, you're doing a magnificent job of helping us to grow the numbers. Uh, we're up to 53 members in the House, and we're still working, and we're going to pick up more members. But really what the key is in, in America is they have been reaching out to state legislatures, state houses, state senates, and asking them to pass resolutions, and they've done that in my own state of North Carolina, where they've introduced, and I think they will pass it. But we've got to get the American people engaged to understand that our financial institutions will not survive unless we bring back Glass-Steagall. And so we're going to be working really hard here in the Congress, trying to reach out to other members of, 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 of our colleagues, ask them to join us, and let's strengthen our financial markets and not make our financial markets prostitutes. All right, there's another issue, very briefly, I want to talk about. 9-11 was one of the worst tragedies America has ever felt. It was sad, a tragic. Over 3,000 Americans killed. Terrorists and planes just brought down gigantic buildings and attempted to hit the White House and ended up hitting the Pentagon. I can honestly say that I'm a strong believer in faith, I'm a strong believer in truth, and no nation, your nation or my nation, will ever survive unless we the people demand the truth. And I have written a letter asking the House Intelligence Committee, Mike Rogers being the chairman, to hold a hearing on the work of Senator Bob Graham who worked so hard to show that there are 28 pages in the 9-11 report that need to be made uh, declassified to make it so that the American people 
and certainly the families of 9-11 can see what happens. So before I close, I want to read one paragraph in the letter that I wrote to the chairman and the ranking member. In the light of those hearings, I urge you as chairman and ranking member to recommend a declassification of the 28 pages of the Congressional Joint Inquiry describing what role the Saudi Arabian government had in the terrorist attack of 9-11. As you know, former Senator Bob Graham has conducted extensive research into this issue and has been nationally recognized and interviewed for his belief that these 28 pages should be declassified. The families of the victims of 9-11 have a right to this information, as do the American people. Since your committee has jurisdiction over this matter, I ask you and the ranking member to please review the attached correspondence from Mr. Mike Lowe, who lost his daughter on American Airlines Flight 11 on that tragic day. As Mr. Lowe states, and I quote, I hope is that over time, history will have the total truth of all the event of 9-11. We need for the people of America to get behind this effort. This effort is for the families and for the strength of America, which means truth. Thank you very much for allowing me to have a little bit of your time. So what I wanted to do uh, to give you a picture, because I think it's hard to grasp the nature of the battle right now if you start simply from right now and don't look at a little bit of this fight. And Helga brought up yesterday uh, the forecast that Lynn made July 25th, 2007, where he said this is not a mortgage crisis that this is the end, it's over, the financial Greetings system from South it, Dakota. is finished. <laughs> it's okay, that's a legislator from uh, South Dakota. The Americans are getting more aggressive these days. <laughs> um, at any rate, uh, so he made this very shocking fo forecast, and then he wrote the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act and we mobilized across the country in the state of Pennsylvania, uh, I mean, dozens of city councils passed resolutions in support of this. We had maybe seven states or so that passed resolutions in their state legislatures. We, we were not able to get it introduced into the Congress because of pressure explicitly from George Soros, uh, Felix Roatan, and others, as Helga mentioned. But, uh, I think after that, the really big and really ugly shift was the election of President Barack Obama. And Lynn has referenced repeatedly this question of the poison of the party system in the United States. And what happened was Obama came in, and first, of course, we wanted to hope that maybe there was something that could be done, maybe some of the people from the Clinton administration could be prevailed upon, that the guy wouldn't be as horrible as we knew his profile had him likely to, to be. Um, but by April of 2009, after Obama's first two foreign visits, and I don't know if people remember what they were, the first one was to London to visit the Queen and Michelle Obama had the famous incident where she touched the queen, but it was okay because the queen loves the Obamas, so nothing bad happened. And then his second visit was to Saudi Arabia. So immediately paying homage to the perpetrators of the 9-11 attacks on the United States. So uh, Lynn, made a forecast in April of 2009 saying that this guy was a malignant narcissist, a failed personality like Nero or Hitler. And shortly thereafter, Obama began to ram through his health care bill, which I know was promoted in the European press as being some kind of European health care. It was actually a Hitlerian scheme to get rid of the useless eaters by turning the entire healthcare system over to the private insurance companies 
and then setting up boards of statisticians to determine whether it was too expensive statistically to keep you alive and to give you medical care. And the bill itself called for $750 billion in cuts from Medicare for the private insurance companies. So we began the campaign with the mustache. Now what happened at this point is all of these people who had worked with us on the Homeowners and Bank Protection Act to maintain party loyalty disappeared. They ran under the bed, they hid under their desk, they slammed their doors, they said, never call me again, don't meet with me again, I can't believe you're saying this, you're over the top. You're over the top. So then what happened? Well, so we had this genocidal health care bill. Then Obama did the humanitarian mission. You might remember the humanitarian mission where we bombed Libya for 250 days without ever going to the Congress for consent. But it was humanitarian. And it wasn't a war. And I was told this by one of the people I ran against in the Democratic primaries who was a Marine. The reason that this was not a war was because no Americans were killed. So if we were just killing other people, this did not qualify as military action. And then, of course, we found out since that there were American boots on the ground and the whole thing was a lie, not surprisingly. And then we had Gaddafi killed while in custody. Then later, as Congressman Jones uh, referenced around the, the Benghazi question, you had the peculiar case of our US ambassador requesting security repeatedly we get an attack on our embassy, our consul, and Obama gets a briefing for 15 minutes and then goes to bed and sleeps for eight hours while four Americans are killed because he has to prepare to go to a fundraiser in Las Vegas the next day, which obviously was much more important than dealing with this emergency. Now, while Obama was presiding over all of these wonderful things and as each one of these developments occurred, some of the people who had scurried away because of the mustache would begin to come out from under their beds and out from behind their desks. And it was beginning to dawn on them that perhaps Mr. LaRouche had not been over the top in his comments about the malignant, evil nature of this presidency, this puppet of the queen who wants to depopulate the planet. So while all this was going on, what else was going on was quantitative easing. Quantitative easing number one, number two, number three, number four. I'm not sure what number we're up to now. And whereas when Obama had come in, we had under W, Bush and Paulson, the beginning of the bailout, the 700 billion TARP, um, by the end of Obama's administration, the amount of money in all of these various bailouts was something around $29 trillion. So there was a fight for Glass-Steagall in 2010. There was a bipartisan attempt from Maria Cantwell, a Democrat, John McCain, a Republican, to add it as an amendment to the Dodd-Frank bill, which I find humorous because it would basically have nullified all of the garbage in the Dodd-Frank bill. And we would have had the votes to pass it, but Obama at Barney Frank and others went on a war to stop it. Then we got a bill introduced in the Congress by Marcy Kaptur. Walter Jones was a co-sponsor. And over this period of a couple of years, we got about 84 co-sponsors. So now what's happening is a it's a revolutionary shift in the United States. Uh, it is a result that the population is not suicidal. And over the years, LaRouche and our organization for decades have been providing a certain quality of leadership which people can see is right. And when people sign on to Glass-Steagall, I will just say, it is not because they're not aware that we have six foot tall posters of Obama with a Hitler mustache in front of their offices. <laughs> they are very aware of this. It's a topic of discussion. And they are deciding to sign on. Uh, what has happened, which is pushing this along, is people have heard of the sequestration. You may remember Standard and Poor's and Moody's decided to downgrade the US debt. We had to cut 
4 trillion, 1.2 trillion out of the budget. This is Obama's policy. So in the last week, what's been affected is a cut, a loss of 750,000 jobs. Medicare uh, is no longer being accepted by many doctors, Medicare patients, because Medicare is not reimbursing the doctors and the hospitals. So many senior citizens, people with serious illnesses are being turned away, not being treated. And we are picking this up all of the time in our organizing. Uh, our own supporters are telling us horror stories of their family members going to get their regular chemotherapy and being told, we're sorry, this is no longer covered. If you want the treatment, put it on your credit card. Um, there was a cancer treatment facility in New York City which had 16,000 patients receiving chemotherapy. They just had to tell 5,000 of them, we will not treat you anymore. Uh, they also are starting a new policy, or an old policy, of debtors' prisons. Now the collection agencies are coming after the people, and if you can't pay the fines, you can go to jail. So what's happened is that this crisis and the fact that we have been present with the solutions over decades has created a momentum where there is now a fight. As Congressman Jones says, we're up to 53 sponsors of the Glass-Steagall bill in the House. We are going to have a spectacular war to get it introduced in the Senate. We have had it introduced in 15 states. Uh, Walter Jones said North Carolina is the latest of the 15, and uh, the two that have passed it are the state of Maine, which I'm particularly pleased with because it's my home state. <laughs> so people there are intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> or they can be. It has very few people in it, so <laughs> relatively. Um, and in the state of Maine, this was quite interesting because it was put as the consent agenda, which means it passed in the House and in the Senate unanimously. And then the legislator who is moving it knows we have to get the U.S. Senate to do this. So he wrote a very sharp press release about this targeting Angus King, who is a newly elected independent senator from Maine, who made a big stink about the financial blowout. He was very aggressively calling for Glass-Steagall all the way up until he was put in the Senate, and now he's been silent. So the Maine state legislature is using the fact that they pa passed this to deliberately target him. Uh, the other state where it passed is South Dakota, and that's um, the legislator we're going to hear from now, what she has to say, you should know it passed there in the House by a vote of 67 to 2, and we do not even have an office in that state as we don't in Maine. This was done by a group of longtime LaRouche activists and supporters who are uh, largely farmers. But go ahead, this is from Patty Miller. Greetings from South Dakota and Minnesota. I'm Patty Miller. And I'm very delighted and honored to have the opportunity to connect with you. Isn't technology amazing when it's used for the right purpose? I made some notes here, so I'm going to read off of them, but they come from my heart. I made them myself, and I'm talking directly to you. So if I seem a little choppy, please forgive me. This is an amazing, amazing convention that you are having, and I so wish I could be there with you. I'm very proud of all of you who've stepped forth, forth in this amazing movement. We are all passing the torch. It's the torch of hope towards some sense of financial sanity. When we place God at the helm and walk in forgiveness of those destroying our God-given freedoms, we cannot fail. But big victory usually comes in the form of many small battles until one day, there it is. We have won a battle in South Dakota and prayerfully next in Minnesota. Tim and Nina and Jeannie and, and Tim Bagalka and many others that I have met, many others that I haven't met, are the heroes here. I simply was in the right place at the right time to carry, help carry out one of God's victories for his people. You are in the right place at the right time to do the same. There 
There are others in this world that you will influence. Keep up the good fight and stay filled with faith, never doubting, never wavering. In Isaiah 55, 11, he claims the victory through his words, speaking the words out loud every day. Speak what we want, not what we see, but what we want, what we're going for. Claim the battle, claim the victory. The tongue is a powerful force. So I pray out loud reading scriptures daily and constantly thanking and worshiping the Lord. He is a God of love and peace. And he will always honor those that honor him. I have some favorite scriptures. And one of them is, is this one, Psalm 8411b. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. This is what you are doing. We are all walking uprightly for a great, great reason. You know, freedom isn't free. And I think you guys understand that better than we do in America. Because in America, we've had years of blessings and productivity. And we've put some very bad leadership in place over the last few years. And there's been this underlying current coming back to slap us in the face and we must get it turned around. We cannot waste our time on anger, though. If Jesus could die on the cross to forgive our sins, then surely I can forgive the worst of the worst. But it does not mean that I accept their behavior or their inhumanity. You are experiencing difficulties that I do not know, and my heart and prayers go out to you. I will love you from afar as the great pioneers that you are doing this. May we truly meet someday and share more victories. I will be watching and praying for all of you. God bless you as you go forth. Thank you so much for inviting me in. Bye. So she was um, motivated enough that she went to Minnesota to help us get it introduced there. We have another state legislator, uh, Tom Jackson, who came to our Schiller Institute conference in Virginia, who then not only met with members of Congress, but when he got back, got on the phone to organize other legislators. So what you have in this fight now is a quality of passion, because it's clear that we don't have forever. We have days, weeks. I think what uh, Jacques said at the beginning, it's a moment where things can change overnight and the world is a different place, is the way that we have to act. So I wanted to just give you a sense, um, a few of the details of the various interventions we've been making to give you a sense of the qualitative shift in the American population, which is driving the shift in the legislatures and the Congress, and hopefully soon the Senate. Um, we got a report, Senator uh, Ron Wyden, who people may be aware, he was the one Democrat who joined Con Senator Rand Paul's filibuster when he was demanding an answer to the question whether Obama thought it was constitutionally legal to kill Americans with drones in the United States without due process, and you might wonder, it took the administration six weeks and a filibuster to answer that question. Um, so Ron Wyden, you would think, had some guts. He joined the filibuster as a Democrat. He bo broke party ranks. So what happened was he was having a town hall meeting in Oregon, and uh, it was a couple hundred people, and then 200 more uh, high school students came in, and we had organizers, Dave Christie, one of my fellow candidates was present and someone on the phone in Seattle just got a list of everyone. They printed off our computer network, everyone we'd met in the street in, in that area of Oregon to see if we could find some other people who would go to this meeting. So just on the spur of the moment, we got two people who said, yes, I'm going to go to this meeting. And um, one of them went, and, or both of them went, and what happened was it was clear that to get your question asked, it was a lottery. So 
you might have a chance of one in 400 that your question would be picked to be asked. And this was too much for the activists. So here's a guy who met us once that we don't even know, and he decides to take matters into his own hands. So uh, Wyden is, is speaking, and they get to the end, and he jumps out of his seat. He says, wait a minute, I want to know, you supported Dodd-Frank. You didn't support Glass-Steagall. Do you know that Dodd-Frank says they can steal our money like they did in Cyprus? Do you support stealing our money? <laughs> this was completely out. And so at that point, then Dave said, well, let me, and Dave went through a very cogent briefing on Glass-Steagall and, and so on. And then, of course, the security guards would not allow Dave to get anywhere near the senator at the end to give him the literature, but that worked out okay because the other supporter, who had been called that day, had the sense to run up and get in line to talk to Senator Wyden personally. So what you have is a degree of activation where people don't have to be told in detail uh, what to do. We have a similar situation right now in the state of, of Connecticut because a very good guy who's actually an inventor who met us in the streets. Ha he came to um, a couple of meetings, then he came to my campaign launching meeting where we had all this music at the beginning, and he said, you know, I am in heaven. This is what, this is the organization I've been looking for my entire life. So he went back to Connecticut and decided he was going to organize a town hall meeting. And he worked his butt off going to, I don't know, 150 family members and friends, and he said, God, you guys do a lot of work. I had no idea it was this hard. So we, we helped him, and we organized a very good town hall meeting, and there were other people there who had met us recently in the field. They have now become a core force to organize the state of Connecticut. So when this slimy little uh, Congressman Himes, who is a... Uh, tweener like me and my husband and and they're really the worst when they're bad <laughs> um, <laughs> at any rate uh, he was speaking and slithering around uh, why we don't need Glass-Steagall so there were eight of these people plus my husband and another organizer at this meeting who were able to keep hammering him on the question of Dodd-Frank and he would say and, and Glass-Steagall, and he said, well, you know, we're doing something now about too big to fail. We're going to break up the banks. And then Chris, who was in the back, yelled, it's not about size, it's about function. And then the whole audience applauded. And then what happened is the local newspaper coverage of the town hall meeting with this slimy little congressman was all about Glass-Steagall. The press coverage was, well, the whole town hall meeting was about Glass-Steagall. <laughs> So that was, um, didn't work so well for him. Uh, right after the, the Cyprus situation broke, uh, we have an activist's phone call every Thursday night um, across the continent. And this is because there are so many areas where we don't have full-time offices, but we have people who want to be active. And this call was growing and growing. It got to be over 200 people. We had to get a new conference system so we can hold now at least 1,000. So right after this Cyprus thing broke, we decided we had to have an emergency conference call. And the, the email started going out to all these different places. And what happened was 500 people got on, tried to get on the conference call. Unfortunately, we had to cut it because we couldn't, the system has this really obnoxious beep when each person got on. <laughs> so when uh, uh, Paul Gallagher was trying to give the briefing, all these beeps were going. So we had to cut it at about 340. But you can see the potential for just the explosion of activism. Uh, also on the shift with Obama, uh, an African-American congresswoman, uh, Karen Bass, in, in California, was holding a town hall meeting. And what happened was she tried to get up and say, you know, denounce the Tea Party and some other things. And when the question of Glass-Steagall came up and the sequestration, she was forced to say, look, this is the policy of Obama. This is Obama's policy. Uh, so you're getting a shift 
from these people. We're getting a shift in the field where we sent a team to deploy at Wall Street in Manhattan, which is typically already a somewhat difficult site, although you can raise some money there. What happened last week is they had their record income. They raised $700 at Wall Street, and they said that it was extreme, that the bad people were really bad and really nasty, and that the organizers would get invigorated from yelling at them. <laughs> and then the good people were very good and really wanted to fight. So you get, uh, and we had things we deployed in, in central Manhattan, and a person who worked at Citibank came running down from the bank with a copy of a large internal Citibank report, which was still warm from the Xerox, because he wanted us to have the secret information about what the Citibank policy is for this crisis. So, I mean, this is a really different dynamic. And we, so we see this, and then we got a, I got a report last night uh, from the Democratic Convention. We have organizers at the Democratic Convention in California. And, and Mr. LaRouche had made this point where the parties have so disintegrated, they've so destroyed themselves with the stupid re-election of Obama that they don't have a quorum to kick us out anymore. So <laughs> what happened at the Democratic Convention is that um, there was a meeting with Nancy Pelosi and the entire discussion that Nancy Pelosi wanted to have was on the subject of gay marriage. So one of our organizers gets called on and says, why are we discussing this? They're cutting Social Security, they're cutting Medicare, uh, we're all gonna be dead, can we talk about something real? The entire room burst into applause and people came running after her afterwards to, to videotape interviews with her to put her on their Facebook pages <laughs> saying this. Uh, then in the Labor Caucus, another, Michael Steger, another, a member of the Policy Committee, was actually invited to speak on Glass-Steagall. And then we got a report on the, um, in the senior citizens meeting, someone who was not with us, but a senior citizen said, how come we're not here to talk about the impeachment of Obama? He's cutting Social Security. He's going to kill us. So, um, I, anyway, these are just a few snapshots of the changed dynamic, but I think this is why uh, Lynn said a couple of our policy discussions ago, we, not that we have one, we could win. We have a lot of work to do, but we could win. The fight in the U.S. right now is we have to build up critical mass to break this ugly logjam in the Senate. And the key to that, I think, is to get these senators to stop being afraid of Satan and to fear God. <laughs>